retrospectively, we've constructed this myth of this amazing angel visited with a supernatural talent who then was taken away from us too soon. The phenomenon Mozart. Cannot somebody come into this world and go leaving behind an unbelievable amount of beauty? It just by chance? It cannot be by chance. Penso che la musica di Mozart è senz'altro unica perché è talmente se, diciamo semplice e profonda che tocca l'anima e il cuore di, sì, di ogni diciamo, persona sensibile. I think Mozart is the god of music. I, I loved him when I was a child and I still enjoy Mozart's music as I enjoy no others. There's something special about this man, which is irresistible. The world's most famous child prodigy, Wolfgang Amadeus Mozart, was born in Salzburg on the 27th of January, 1756. His father, Leopold, was a violinist at the court of the ruling Prince Archbishop and already had a considerable reputation as a teacher. He took sole charge of the education of both Wolfgang and an older daughter, Nanerl. Both children were musical, but Leopold realized very quickly that his son's talents were quite exceptional. Mozart's first surviving composition was written at the astonishing age of only five. What's remarkable about this piece, besides its brevity, is that it changes its meter halfway through. It's in, in triple time for a little, and then it goes into duple time. It shows no kind of, of focus whatsoever, and yet it's not ungrammatical. Now, what's interesting is that within several months, we do have these, these more famous pieces, like... piece is perfectly formed. I mean, it can't be improved on. You may like other Mozart or Beethoven or Schubert minuets more than that, but, but it is exactly within the style. It has the right form uh, and seems to have an, an, an unerring sense of what the next harmonic move is going to be. I mean, it's utterly professional. By the time Wolfgang was six, the pattern of his childhood was set. Leopold recognized that this phenomenal talent needed training, experience, and exposure. The family set out on a series of grand European tours in which the miracle that was Mozart and the musical profession would be properly introduced to each other. English scientists, French intellectuals, crowned heads, fellow musicians, everybody was intrigued by the limitless abilities of the miniature Mozart. The ultimate child prodigy had been born. One of the insights that researchers have had is a prodigy can't exist unless an awful lot of things happen at the same time. You have to have somebody who's very talented to begin with. You have to have parents and teachers who provide an enormous amount of support. You have to have an audience that will pay attention. You have to have somebody who's a very quick study so he or she can learn from their experiences and so on. Not enough attention has been paid to what kind of a historical milieu you need in order for there to be the recognition of a prodigy. And I think in the 18th century, Europe was becoming enough of a place where you could move from one country to another fairly easily, where people knew the several different languages which were needed, where there was enough affluence in a court so one could get together the, uh, the guilders, the ducats that were needed to be able to pay for Mozart. And it's probably harder to think that that could have happened a couple centuries earlier. In the late 18th century, the musical landscape of Europe was also changing. Earlier, Baroque music had been designed largely for church or court. But now, the emerging middle classes created a new market for music, the public concert. Johann Christian Bach, Johann Sebastian's youngest son, settled in London, Europe's leading capital for concert life. 
his new public audience demanded a distinctively new musical style. You have to appeal to a larger public which means that you have to write music which is more dramatic and at the same time music in which the form is easily perceptible. And what you get is um, the forms in which uh, instead of this relatively um, level kind of tension that goes through a piece of Baroque music, you start at a low level of tension with a classical piece and then you raise the tension and it becomes more dramatic. <laughs> Throughout Europe, Mozart became aware of this dramatic new classical language. When he finally arrived in London, the eight-year-old composer became close friends with J.C. Bach and there wrote his first classical symphony. There seems to be a magic number 10. It seems to take about 10 years to get to be really good in something. And that's independent of whether it means to be a good writer or a good musician or a good mathematician or a good dancer or whatever. And Mozart's no exception, actually. The funny thing about Mozart is he started music when he was uh, still in Knickers, when he was three and four and five. But I would say he became really expert by the age of 13, 14, 15. He was as good as they come in the world by the age of 25. And in the last 10 years of his life, he, he set the standard for the future. When Wolfgang was 14, he was ready to show the world what he was made of. Leopold knew if there was one thing that would determine his son's success as a composer, it was opera. The Italians dominated the opera house, both in Italy and in Northern Europe. This is why composers like Paisiolo Salieri are there at the top of the list, and why Mozart has such difficulty competing with them. For each of his three trips to Italy in the 1770s, Mozart writes some kind of opera and has it performed in Milan. The first one was Mitridati Re di Ponto, um, which is an opera seria, where Mozart is really learning his trade, writing a serious opera in the grand manner. Mitridate was a huge success, and when Mozart was 17, the family were wealthy enough to move from their cramped three-room flat to a spacious house in a prestigious Salzburg square. Mozart began to spend more time at home and less traveling. His apprenticeship was over, but his experience as an opera composer began to influence all the instrumental music of this period. The A major violin concerto of 1775 is now recognized as one of Mozart's first early masterpieces, and opera is the key to understanding some of its most imaginative and unexpected gestures. When the soloist first enters, it is usual to hear music the orchestra has already played, but here, the violinist begins with an entirely new idea. Of course, this in instrumental terms is, is really remarkable. In vocal terms, and operatic terms, it's absolutely standard. The moment of personal privilege of, uh, of the diva is shown by saying, I bow to no one, not even this orchestra. If I feel like being grand or being melancholy, the fact that you've done this splendid thing is of no importance to me. we're talking about when he's writing the violin concertos in this period of 1775. He's 19 years old and he's writing the A major symphony. You know. When you listen to those pieces you can say for what they are they cannot be improved. 
there is a, a slightly courtly, slightly worldly synthesis of operatic and instrumental elements. Very Italian, it, full of the southern sense of charm. In order for Mozart to go beyond that, his life had to be subjected to external strain. He was still at 19 and adolescent. He hadn't fallen in love. He hadn't suffered any real trauma. For Mozart, there was certainly plenty of trouble ahead. Age 21, he fell in love for the first time with Aloysia Weber, a 16-year-old singer who at first seemed interested, but then spurned him. And in 1778, accompanied by his mother, he set off for Paris, one of Europe's main musical capitals, where for the first time, he was to encounter real personal tragedy. Mozart went to Paris because it had become clear to him and his father that he would never have a good, well-paying job in Salzburg. The idea was that Mozart should find a very good job and then bring his family to join him and that the family should move. <laughs> Mozart knew that if he were to be successful, he had to be popular, and his Paris symphony was shrewdly calculated to please its French audience. I had noticed, he wrote to his father, that all first and last movements here begin with a loud flourish from all the instruments together. So I began my finale very quietly, with just the violins, and followed that with a sudden loud passage. As I'd expected, the audience all whispered hush at the start, and then, when they heard the loud music, burst out clapping. But overall, the trip was a disaster. Mozart didn't like Paris and spent far more money than he earned. Worst of all, his mother became ill, and on the very day that he wrote to his father about the symphony's success, she died. He's writing this letter about the success of his symphony, and his mother is lying dead in the next room. It's rather horrifying, actually. But in fact, the tactical thing that this 22-year-old is trying to do is as nothing to, to what it means to him as an artist. And to me, I'm absolutely convinced that the wildness of the A minor sonata which lashes out in a kind of, of, of uh, rage of, of, of impotence. The maestoso at the beginning one imagines the fists really striking the instrument. And the sense of helplessness of... This kind of music has, has no counterpart in what he's done before. Now, mind you, I know many of people who play the piece in a much more civilized fashion, but I don't think that's the point. There's something absolutely psychotic about this piece. It's, it's absolutely terrifying, these chromatic scales, these slithering things that, that, that suck him into the vortex. And the last movement with its these leaping sounds in the, in the left hand that are so difficult to play, actually, there's absolutely no counterpart to those in the music of any other composer, and they can only be understood as a paroxysm of a, of a man who's, who's over the edge. Nowhere in France could Mozart find the prestigious job he knew he deserved, and in 1779, he was forced to return home. How I detest Salzburg, he wrote. Salzburg is no place for my talent. It has no opera, no theater, and even if they wanted one, who is there to sing? He'd been one of the musical glories of Europe, but now he was a mere concertmaster in the provincial Salzburg court, still living under the controlling thumb of his father. For Mozart, the answer lay just over the mountains to the east in Vienna. The Age of Enlightenment was leading Europe out of the dark Middle Ages into a new modern world, a world based on individual freedom and reason, rather than aristocratic power and the dictates of the church. In 1780, the great Enlightenment Emperor Joseph II took the Habsburg throne, 
and he led Vienna into one of the most exciting decades of its history. Er hat die Bauernbefreiung initiiert. Er hat die Rechte des Adels beschnitten. Er hat versucht, das Bürgertum zu heben. Und da kam vor allem zustatten die Zensurfreiheit. Die es wurde in Aussicht gestellt, dass man, dass jeder das Recht hat, das zu sagen und zu schreiben, was er denkt. Und es ist eigenartig, dass Mozart gerade in jener Monat, als diese Verordnung Gesetzeskraft bekam, im Juni äh, 81, endgültig sich entschließt, nach Wien zu gehen. When the 25-year-old Mozart had been summoned to Vienna as part of the Salzburg court, he'd seized his chance. Severing all ties with his former employer, he determined to go it alone in Vienna. Already when he arrived, there was a real sense of kind of ferment going on, a sense of suddenly, it's almost like when the wall came down um, in Eastern Europe, and suddenly there was for a moment an enormous sense that everything was possible, and people really flocked to Vienna as the most liberal, exciting, intellectually exciting, socially exciting city in Europe. This is a splendid place, wrote Mozart soon after arriving. In my opinion, the best in the world. The first thing he finds is that the people here, the, the aristocracy, the patrons, treat him like an equal. And that really was what he had been looking for all the time he'd been traveling throughout Europe. Everywhere he went, he, I mean, he knew he was better than you know, a far greater person. I mean, he was never a modest man. That was one of his problems. Um, he knew he was a, was a far more considerable person than these kind of, you know, useless aristocrats. Within a few months of his arrival, Mozart had started work on a German opera, the Entführung aus dem Serai, the abduction from the Seraglio. If you want to make it in Vienna in the 1780s, you write opera. There's no doubt about it. And if you're writing opera in the early 1780s, it has to be German opera. And there's a very particular reason for that. The emperor at the time, Joseph II, was anxious to promote opera as a national forum, a national phenomenon, a way of making a particularly German political statement. And so Joseph II had, in effect, thrown out the Italians from the opera house. The opera itself is what we call a singspiel, a song play. In other words, it has songs and spoken dialogue. It's not music all the way through. This was very common for German opera at the time, and very often Singspieler actually have exotic oriental plots, and that's one of the issues behind Die Entführung. The plot is basically concerning a Turkish pasha and his relationships with Westerners in all sorts of interesting ways. <laughs> Mozart knew exactly how to write for the voice. He changed the art of singing, really. Before him, Baroque music was very much, you sang much more instrumentally, whereas I feel that Mozart turned it around, changed the whole thing, and heard everything in his head as a voice. And he wrote things very, very quickly. It, it, he was like a spring, and it, the music, I feel, came bubbling out of him. And that's what it feels like to sing it. <laughs> Mozart found the new liberal Vienna stimulating and sympathetic. He quickly made friends with a number of its leading cultural and intellectual figures. Like many of them, he became deeply committed to Freemasonry, which, with its ideals of brotherhood and understanding, was flourishing in Joseph's new Vienna. Certainly, the main um, a group that Mozart himself was associated with, the people who he knew and so on, were involved with a type of um, masonry which was really much more like a kind of literary academy, scientific academy, or whatever. They were concerned with, well, with promoting enlightenment ideas. 
and that if that meant actually um, discussing questions to do with science or to do with you know, the latest political thinking from France or the latest novels from Germany, that's what used to go on. Friends and connections were extremely important. With no patron or employer, Mozart was now effectively the first freelance composer in Vienna's thriving modern economy. He was his own manager, his own businessman, his own everything. He was organizing concerts, promoting them. He was getting together the subscription lists. He was running around to publishers to get the works published. He was an immensely competent um, businessman manager. Mozart's ultimate ambition was fame, honor, and wealth. Combining his skills as composer, performer, inventor, showman, and entrepreneur, he developed something new that would bring him all three, the piano concerto. He was a deeply pragmatic man. He didn't just compose on a wing and a prayer. He composed because he needed to make money, he needed to woo the Viennese audiences, and he would have been very adept at using the best possible resources available to him at the time. And I can only think that there must have been some stunning woodwind players in Vienna in, in the 1780s, because during that decade, his woodwind writing became far more confident more complex, more varied, more rich, more beautiful. And for instance, in the development of the first movement of the A major concerto, there's this wonderful passage of dialogue whereby the clarinets and the woodwind have the long line, the strings have bouncing, dancing figures underneath, and the piano interweaves between the two. It is really one of the most wonderful passages of Mozart dialogue that I know. special characteristics. It's in A major, in Mozart's erotic key. It has no oboes in it, which makes the sound very much smoother. Clarinets are kind of soprano violas for Mozart. And usually when the violas are divided, he makes it the most erotic noise in the orchestra because it's so furry and thick and sweet. And when he adds clarinets, of course, it enhances the whole thing. Mozart really paved the way for a new way of writing these kinds of pieces. Mozart used the piano concerto as an ideal foil to present himself to the audience in three guises, as composer, as performer, and as improviser. Now, interestingly enough, that order, which is the order I think we would consider is the opposite of the order of the adulation he received. His music was admired, his piano playing was incomparable, but his improvisations were beyond delight. Mozart dazzled his audience with many magical improvisations in just one concerto, leaving all other pianists with a problem. Should you just play the notes Mozart wrote down or add your own embellishment to Mozart's text? 
The end of this slow movement is particularly contentious. The piano line in the score looks actually very bare and simple, again with rising and falling intervals, far larger than at the beginning, right from the top of the piano down to the bottom and up again. And nothing else is written in. Now, Mozart did this quite often. He would leave a bare line, but in performance himself, he would have embellished it. And from performance to performance, this would have varied, and he would never have bothered to write it down. There is no subject that divides musicians more and takes up their blood pressure more. It's a very, very personal thing. At a master class at London's Royal Academy of Music, Robert Levin demonstrated a particularly ornate version of this passage from a newly identified 18th century manuscript. It turns out, according to researchers of the last couple of years, that the handwriting of this document is readily identifiable. This embellishment is in the hand of Barbara Ployer, who was a pupil of Mozart's in the mid-1780s. Now, the exact notes that she writes down are debatable, but the number of notes must be taken very seriously. The chances that that woman, in attempting to embellish a passage by her teacher that she heard him perform, that she attempted to use demi-semi-quavers where Mozart would only have used crotchets and quavers, are close to zero. You don't know that Mozart didn't want that bareness because he exploits it all over the place. He, he, he loves to do that. He loves to stop the motor and you don't know where you are. To put frills on it seems to me some appropriate. In 1782, Mozart married the singer Constanza Weber, the younger sister of his first love, Aloysia. Back in Salzburg, Leopold did not approve of the match, but Mozart had no intention of marrying for economic or political reasons. When we look at Mozart's attitudes on love and sex and marriage, what we find is um, really a, a sort of prototypical middle-class um, uh, outlook, um, contrary to the sort of portrayals of him as a kind of philanderer with lots of girlfriends. He was actually rather prudish. His other sort of attitude on marriage is that you should marry someone you love, um, and you shouldn't have an overly romantic idea of love. <laughs> Describing Constanza to his father, Mozart is far from flattering. She's not ugly, but certainly not beautiful either, he wrote. What is important is that she loves me and I love her with all my heart. Could I wish for a better wife? The year after their marriage, the couple travelled back to Salzburg in the hope of reconciling Leopold to the match, and at the end of their stay, Mozart's unfinished C minor mass was performed in his favorite Salzburg church, St. Peter's. The C minor mass is a very odd work. Mozart wrote it in response to a vow he made. His fiancée, Constanze Weber, um, was ill, 
and he made a vow that if she recovered, he would write a mass. As she did recover, they eventually married, and so Mozart had to fulfill his vow. But there was also another issue, I think. Mozart was feeling intensely guilty about his marriage to Constanza. In effect, he'd gone off with a chorus girl, and Leopold, Mozart's father, was deeply unhappy about this. And Mozart was trying to achieve a reconciliation with his father. One way of doing it was to provide a vehicle for Constanza to display her vocal abilities. And indeed, she sang in the performance of the C minor mass in Salzburg in 1783. The other way was simply to write a mass as some kind of expiation, if you like, as a way of expunging the guilt he feels about his marriage. But Leopold never properly gave his blessing, and Mozart never again returned to Salzburg. In Vienna, Mozart was continually stimulated by new ideas. One of his most important new friends there was the imperial librarian, Baron Gottfried van Swieten, a key figure in Joseph's reforming government. Van Swieten adored Baroque music, and he fired a passionate enthusiasm in Mozart for Bach and Handel, who at that time were thought to be rather old-fashioned and largely forgotten. The great German biographers of Mozart um, valued Bach much more highly than Handel. Bach embodies seriousness in German values. Handel was suspected of frivolousness. He went to Italy and did opera, and then he went to England. Um, and so they thought it was a much greater praise to say that Mozart was imitating Bach when he worked on his fugues. But I think Mozart was also interested in Handel to an, an extraordinary degree. Counterpoint for him was this kind of superficial, getting this to go with that. And suddenly he heard music which was phenomenally full of content and character. And Mozart went into a creative tailspin. He started writing one fugue after another, after another, after another, all fragments. And finally he writes a few of them which, which do survive, some of which are a little bit learned, like the prelude and fugue in C major, K, uh, 394, which has the subject of... exactly smell the wood burning, but you, you can tell that even though uh, uh, it, it might be Mozart, it's, it's not entirely easy. He has to get over that hurdle and internalize it. It was the hardest thing for him to do. When he succeeded, we got the finale of the G major string quartet. Of all the composers Mozart met in Vienna, the greatest was Joseph Haydn. Haydn had this ability to combine intellectual content with popularity. Mozart set about writing string quartets in the Haydn manner. I don't mean he copied Haydn's style, but he copied Haydn's ideas. And as time went on, he decided to dedicate all six to Haydn. And the time came when they were finished and he played them to Haydn. And the second time he played them all over again, Leopold Mozart was there on a visit. And uh, Haydn turned to Leopold Mozart and he said, I swear to you before God and as an honest man, age of enlightenment, that your son is the greatest composer I know either personally or by reputation. People had trouble even with, with, with Haydn's quartets, and they had trouble with Mozart's quartets. They, of course, because of the density of thought. And density of thought, it's always difficult in music. The simpler it is, music, the easier it is to listen to. But Mozart wasn't entirely interested in that.
The early 1780s were indeed Mozart's glory years. Wealthy and successful, he and Constanza moved into a spacious apartment right in the center of Vienna, now known as the Figaro House. It was here that Leopold stayed on his single visit to Vienna in 1784, where Haydn came to talk and listen to music, and where Mozart was visited by an aspiring 16-year-old composer from Bonn, Ludwig van Beethoven. He wrote a whole string of masterpieces here, um, 11 piano concertos, uh, the Haydn string quartets, and of course the Marriage of Figaro. Unlike the German abduction from the Seraglio, Mozart's Marriage of Figaro is an Italian comic opera. Mozart had invested a great deal of energy in German opera. He was very committed to German opera, but passion changed. And so the Italians came back into the opera house and Mozart had to turn to writing Italian opera. So Mozart met Lorenzo da Ponte, the librettist who was living in Vienna, and he seems to have suggested to da Ponte that they should take this play by Beaumarchais, this scandalous political play, Le Mariage de Figaro, and turn it into an opera, Le Nozze de Figaro. Figaro was moderately successful in Vienna, but in Prague it took the city by storm. The Estates Theatre there is now the only opera house in which Mozart worked that still survives. To work with Mozart music in this theatre is a really very special thing. It's something which you can find only in Prague, because this is something coming from the original place, something coming from the uh, building where Mozart used to conduct, used to play, used, used to rehearse. Written just three years before the French Revolution threw Europe into turmoil, the story of Mozart's Figaro concerns the complex web of relationships between masters and servants in a nobleman's household. I think people have overstressed the prophetic revolutionary character of the marriage of Figaro. Um, I don't think either of them had a feeling that um, you know, it's only a matter of mm, a year or two before the, before the revolution comes. We'd better get something which will anticipate it. Um, uh, people do the same with Chekhov. They say that Chekhov's plays are, in fact, prophetic of the forthcoming revolution. And I don't think that's really an important aspect of Mozart. There are themes which are part of what culminated in the revolution, a sense of the injustice of uh, inherited power and wealth. <laughs> Mozart never abandoned his joy in creating melody for ordinary folk. He was always saying, this will please both the learned and the ordinary person. He writes to his father from Prague, every errand boy whistles my tunes. Now, you know, if a composer, when I was growing up, had said a thing like that, the critic would say, oh, really? You know, with a kind of sneering intonation. Well, it was good enough for Mozart, it's certainly good enough for me. Cantare la musica di Mozart è comunque difficilissimo perché c'è bisogno di un grandissimo rigore tecnico e di una libertà di fraseggio. Quindi mh, eh, cantare non è semplice e cantare Mozart è ancora, ancora meno semplice, è difficilissimo. C'è questa continuità, eh, questo fraseggio così puro e pulito, e irraggiungibile quasi.
Mozart is now beyond doubt the most popular of all classical composers. But in his time, the rich complexity of his music often troubled his audiences, except in Prague. Prague had a reputation for being, in some ways, more sophisticated than the Viennese when it comes to music. Prague seems to have loved Mozart's style. They seem to have gone for this very richly hued kind of musical style that Mozart specialized in. He wrote the Prague Symphony for Prague. He also wrote Don Giovanni for Prague. And a lot of the color of Don Giovanni is due, I think, to a very specific Prague taste. Don Giovanni, Mozart's second collaboration with Da Ponte, is an extraordinarily dark and dramatic work, and its hero, a ruthless libertine, is one of the most disturbing and enigmatic characters in all opera. He's a creature of the, of the darker side of the Enlightenment, and I think that Don Giovanni is himself a rather equivocal figure in this way. He represents, in some sense, um, the overthrowing of traditional practices, traditional morality, which could be associated with the notion of the Enlightenment. But on the other hand, he also represents uh, dark irrationality. We have to see it in terms of when the opera was written in Vienna in 1787. Um, which is just about the period, the moment, when the whole climate um, of opinion towards Joseph's reforms was beginning to turn. Basically, um, people said he'd gone too far, that by lo loosening up all of the social constraints and so on, that actually he had simply unleashed a kind of moral relativism. It's the same sort of dilemma people we, we hear today, you know, that we've lost our sense of social values or moral values, and we must go back to, you know, good old-fashioned religious values, children should be beaten at school, and all that sort of thing. So G Don Giovanni is more than a sexual liberty. He actually brings with him a kind of real social chaos. When the commendatory arrives in that terrifying moment and then Don Giovanni takes his hand and gets dragged down to hell, uh, is portrayed in the most wonderfully dramatic music. Um, you have this very dark minor key, it's a very gloomy music. The orchestration is very thick, the wind instruments, the trombones, the horns are blaring out there. The harmony is absolutely astonishing to analyze, to even listen to. It's these very dense, thick, rich chords that just produce the most astonishing sense of musical terror. Now, if you listen to Bach, lots of emotions, but not terror. If you listen to Handel, you can hear th uh, hailstones and thunder and lightning, not terror. This was a new element, and of course, people just sat there with their mouth open. <laughs> Oh, my God. 
1787, the year of Leopold's death, marked a real crisis point for Mozart himself. Vienna's economy was in trouble, and Mozart, at 30, was no longer the new man in town. Returning home after Don Giovanni, he found the tide had turned against him. His commissions began to dry up, his subscribers dwindled away. Mozart is an absolute classic example of what happens to somebody who um, is swept up into the possibilities of a free market economy and then finds that when that um, collapses, they get um, left on the scrap heap. He appeared to have the most astounding inner freedom which functioned absolutely independently uh, from the circumstances of his life. You'd think that when he was in all that debt and his whole life was crumbling, that something would have given way. Not at all. He wrote his greatest pieces. He wrote a few string quintets, which turn out to be the greatest chamber music we have. He wrote three symphonies and threw them in a drawer. And his circumstances were awful. <laughs> Mozart's last three symphonies were written very quickly during the summer of 1788. Among the most loved of all his works, they also contain some of his most remarkable music. Mozart's G minor symphony is an extraordinary work. It's extraordinary in various ways. One is that it begins without the usual symphonic fanfare. Most symphonies begin with a bang or something to call the audience to attention and to get the orchestra together. This symphony begins with a little rustling in the violas, and then in comes a very mysterious melody. seems to determine the course of the whole long first movement. It comes back again and again in dozens of guises, slower, faster, upside down, right side up. Um, it's as if it's an obsession. Now the beginning of the G minor symphony, that is a beginning that begins in the middle of things, instead of with an announcement, um, had a profound effect on romantic composers. Romantic composers precisely wanted to get away from framing devices and formalities and seem to be spontaneous. And one way was to plunge right in. So you hear many symphonies by Mendelssohn and Bruckner and, and uh, Mahler that take a page from Mozart's book Beethoven's Ninth begins with mysterious rustling sounds that are descended from Mozart's G minor symphony. Mozart made life extraordinarily difficult for those who came after. Beethoven had the most problems, of course, because he was the immediate successor to Mozart. The intellectual competence of Mozart was something that Beethoven really never achieved, did he? I mean, Mozart had no problems. He had absolutely no problems in expressing himself. He could do anything. If there is one place that Mozart flaunts his unrivaled mastery of musical language, it is surely the last movement of his last symphony. Other composers could play with combinations of two, maybe three themes, but here, Mozart uses five. I mean, he must have, he must have made sketches, for this. he must have begun, I think, with the last few pages, to see um, whether the combinations really worked. I mean, he did do this, but nobody's found the page where he did it. Then he's right. Now, out of this, I'm going to make a... Uh, a movement which is partly sonata, partly contrabandal hijinks, and then at the end I'm going to put them all together and produce this riot, this drunken riot of music making, which is, t takes about an, a minute and a half. <laughs> That's one of the most wonderful things that we have. <laughs> During 
his lifetime, he was considered essentially a very difficult composer. People complained about Mozart that he overloaded the instrumentation so you couldn't hear the singers in his operas and um, that, that in his instrumental pieces he was never satisfied with one melodic idea but he would have one melody and then another melody and another one so it was extremely hard to concentrate on his music. Uh, then, of course, in the 19th century, everything changed. Mozart became a composer of sort of sweetness and grace who had no difficulty, was the example of an easy composer. What is interesting is that it has taken, I think, the 20th century to restore some of the difficulty of Mozart to understand why he was such a complex and dramatic composer. <laughs> Mozart's last collaboration with Da Ponte was Cosia Fan Tutte, written when Mozart was 34. Completely neglected after his lifetime, it only returned to the repertoire in this century. <laughs> you have to ask yourself is what is it about the 20th century which enabled us to see what is in this 18th century genius and I think that's a very difficult question we would like to think it's because we're so damn smart that uh, how much cleverer we are than they were we can see what they failed to notice um, how could they have left Cosifan Tutte neglected for so many years it must be that we are cleverer than, we, than, than they are it, it's, it's just not like that it isn't um, uh, human, human history is not a history of increasing uh, cleverness and increasing acuity of vision. It's just that we change our vision, and therefore we see something in Mozart which they didn't. The year 1791 marked the beginning of an upturn in Mozart's fortunes. Now living in a new apartment in Rauensteingasse, he was the proud father of two sons, Karl and Franz, and still happily married to Constanza. At 35, his career as a composer was picking up again. The new Magic Flute opened in Vienna in September and was overnight a smash hit. New commissions kept him furiously busy, in particular one from the eccentric Count Walzeg for a requiem in memory of his wife. But the requiem was never finished. Mozart was at the height of his powers, his future full of promise, but on the 18th of November, he suddenly became seriously ill. It's now common consensus of all serious theories that it was a, a, some kind of a kidney ailment and a kidney failure that did in Mozart. So at the age of 35, when a kind of Asiatic flu, well, something like that hit Mozart, because it says in the documents that a lot of people were very sick in Vienna and a lot died. Something like that hit Mozart, and this poor old system just couldn't take it. After a service at St. Stephen's Cathedral, his body was taken to St. Mark's Cemetery on the outskirts of Vienna. His modest third-class funeral was entirely in accordance with Joseph's reformed rules on burial practice. Hearing of his death, Haydn declared, the world will not see such a talent again for a hundred years. What I find irreplaceable about Mozart, as far as the operas are concerned, is that his psychological reality. He just inexhaustibly expresses what I feel to be the truth about, about how human beings get on with one another. 
Uh, and it's about this mortal life and nothing else. La musica di Mozart mi tocca profondamente. Penso che una musica sincera. E è un compositore sincero e i personaggi mozartiani sono personaggi fragili e allo stesso tempo passionali e profondi. We all have this who like Mozart, have this feeling, say in one of the slow movements, an almost excruciating emotion of i don't know what, I can't finish that sentence. There's only one name for that emotion, and it's the name of the composer.